Coming up next on Weathered Impact Forum main stage is the exciting keynote about future of cities and robocars by the amazing chair of networks and computers at Singularity University. Give a warm welcome to Brad Templeton. Good afternoon. Uh, let's see, we're bringing up my slides right now. I'm here to tell you about the coming marriage of computers and cars. And it's already underway, and it's going to change the world in ways that you may be surprised to learn about. Now, there are many factors that have made this exciting to people, why you've heard about all the investment that's been going on. And they are quite remarkable, and they've led to some quite remarkable results. This is Moore's Law. I hope all of you know what Moore's Law is the rule that's governed the computer industry for so long, coming to transportation as it has come to music and every other industry that the computer has attacked. Now, the first reason everybody got into this was just the ability to save lives. After all, we see over 1.5 million people around the world killed every year in car accidents. 40% of those fatalities involve alcohol, and it's a good thing because robots almost never get completely drunk. And as a result, we can do something about that but there are some other numbers of cars and what they do to our society that may surprise you. For example, uh, this is Houston, uh, an American city, which is particularly bad, but more than 60% of the land in the city belongs to cars. And this is true even in European, European cities outside of the, you know, the old towns in the central areas which were not built for cars. The global ground transportation industry is worth about five trillion American dollars, uh, and that obviously has excited a lot of people for the chance to get into it. Another number that may surprise you is that each year, I've calculated that Americans, for example, spend 50 billion hours doing this. 50 billion hours. To put that in context, the entire productive labor output of the American people is about 240 billion hours. And they spend 50 billion of them turning steering wheels. But here's an even more mind-boggling number for the whole world. I calculated that all of us together every year drive about 1.7 light years. Now, how many of you use light years in your work as a unit of human activity? Uh, it's not something you'll often hear or think about or be able to comprehend. Now, this has got everybody into the game, all the big car companies. This is a Mercedes from some time ago. Um, yeah, Tesla, you've all, I'm sure, are familiar with and seen them go by. Tesla owners woke up uh, several years ago to find their car had added a feature, not to drive itself, but to keep itself in the lane and keep the speed while you just watched and, and nub nudged the wheel. And they are also pretend that they're going to have a real full self-drivability in the same hardware any day now, if you listen to Elon Musk. Uh, this is a European a German car company that may have issues saying, trust your life to our software, why would we ever lie? Um, but in fact, that scandal has actually forced them to reinvent themselves and may actually help them as the world changes. But the real excitement to me is not coming from the car companies. It's coming from the high-tech companies and the startups, of which there are hundreds and hundreds, many with unicorn valuations in this space. Uh, this is just a few of them. There are many, many more. And there are also companies trying to do trucking. This is a startup that's received multi-billion dollar valuations to do trucking. Um, Amazon paid a billion dollars to buy one of the startups, which has built this custom-made vehicle. They say they're not buying it just to do deliveries. They say they want to actually move people around and make a taxi service with it. And in fact, even Apple Computer is in the game. This is one of Apple's cars I videoed out of my car. You're not supposed to do this, by the way. Now, the Apple project is pretty secret. I've, I have learned one secret thing about the Apple car, though, and that is you're going to need to get the new iPhone if you want to use it. So, um, you know, that might not be a joke. Who knows about what they're doing? This new business that the startups and the high-tech companies want to play in is not the business of selling cars that Mercedes and VW have been in for 100 years. It's the business of selling rides, like Uber or My Taxi is in, rather than the business of selling cars. That's more attractive, actually, because you get all the money. You're the fuel, you're the car, you're the insurance, you're the maintenance, you're everything together if you can get people to switch from cars to buying rides. And so that's what many, many companies have done. General Motors 
has a subsidiary called Cruise, which is building these custom vehicles. They'll deploy in Dubai next year, they promise. They're already, however, on the streets of San Francisco, running around with no one in them, giving rides to people, members of the public, and charging them for money. They're running an Uber-like taxi service in San Francisco today. And I'm going to show you a few other people who are doing it. This is, um, I think this is a video. Oh my God, this is oh, so cool. This down. <laughs> so this I is, this is not really that vehicle, but it's their own custom vehicle, as you can see, driving in the streets of a busy city with no one inside, even charging money for it. In China, there are three companies now that are doing that. AutoX is uh, another startup. They released this little video here, which is just to show off, to show that they have a fleet of a thousand of their taxis now running around Shenzhen and some other Chinese cities. Uh, this is Baidu, which is the, sort of the Google of China, the search engine company. And they now have their vehicles running around, taking people around uh, uh, both Beijing and now Shanghai. And another company called WeRide is doing it as well in China. The leader, though, is a cousin of Google. It was started at Google. I worked on this yeah. project when it was inside Google. Uh, and they've now driven probably around 50 million kilometers in these vehicles on real-world streets. And they, in fact, are offering taxi service now in both the Phoenix, Arizona area, and here they just began earlier this year also offering rides in San Francisco. So a lot of people ask about this. They say, well, you know, this is interesting, it's great, but when am I going to get one? When is it going to happen? The answer to that question is, unfortunately, it depends on where you are. And in five or six cities around the world already, the answer is now. In fact, it was running in uh, Phoenix, Arizona three years ago. And when it gets to your city is a more difficult and complex question, which depends on when the companies are ready to deploy and how easy it is to drive in your city and how much money they think they'll make from it. What do we get, though, when we have these robo-taxis, as we like to call them, Vehicles that you can just summon with a phone, very much like, uh, well, Uber you don't have in Bulgaria, but most of the world has something like that. And it just comes to you, takes you where you want to go, you don't have to drive, you could be sitting with your friends face to face, you can be doing your work, it doesn't take time out of your day. Vehicles like that can do four key things. Drive you around and keep you safe, of course, but also deliver themselves to you. It makes things be, uh, well, I'll show you in a second what, what you actually get from that. The vehicles also do some neat things. They refuel or recharge themselves. And this has big consequences for the energy, and they also store, or what we used to call park themselves. Now, when the vehicles can deliver themselves, it's like you have a cloud of cars. They're just out there in the city, and you just summon one, and it comes. You don't necessarily have to own a car. Some people will continue to own a car. They want to do that. Some people will give up car ownership, or maybe never had it, and they'll be able to summon cars from this cloud, but for a price that is more like owning a car, or even cheaper, rather than the price of a taxi cab. This has consequences for energy. As I mentioned, um, the vehicles can recharge or refuel themselves, and as a result of that, almost all the projects that are doing this are trying to build electric cars rather than gasoline, or that's their long-term goal is to be electric. So we're going to use this as one of the ways we move the world to electric vehicles, which is pretty important because, well, there's this guy, right? Have you have you've heard of this guy? Uh, any trouble in this uh, region because of him? Well, all the trouble he's causing is fueled by the fact that Germany and the rest of Europe keep paying him money to buy his oil and natural gas. And if we can move our transportation to electric, we can do a lot, we can save the environment, we can stop global warming, and we can also get rid of guys like this. And that's a lot for software to do. Uh, you know, may, many of you may be pitching the best uh, B2B e-commerce blockchain um, metaverse tool, but software can actually change the world in very big geopolitical ways. Now, I've told you about being on the ground. This is Sebastian Thrun, the man who got me into self-driving cars. He got a lot of people into self-driving cars. Here's what he built next which is an aircraft that takes off vertically like a drone, then flies with wings once it's up in the air. Okay. So this is another remarkable ability because it lets people not need roads, as you, well, hopefully we can kill that, not need roads, as they would say in Back to the Future. Um, there are close to 300 companies all trying to make vehicles like this. And the engineering problems are being solved. The vehicles fly, they make a little more noise, 
than they want them to right now. They need to worry about air traffic control. But this is definitely happening now. It's not going to happen this year, next year. This is something you're going to see maybe in the early 2030s. But it's definitely coming and will be real and will mean you can get not just where roads are, but everywhere in the world very cheaply. Here's an early Canadian version. I'm Canadian, so I've got to show one of those. So as you can see, it took off like a drone, and now it's going to tilt itself forward, and now it's flying on those little wings. So this is not something people have dreamed up. You were promised flying cars, you're going to get flying cars. I'm then going to go back to the ground and tell you that all around the world, there is one product which is so important, so vital, that no matter where it is, you are, no matter when it is, you can get it in 30 minutes or less, right? Well, companies now are trying to build technologies that will bring you anything in 30 minutes or less. This is an Estonian company I'm involved with called Starship. We have built these little robots which drive on the sidewalk. And they have now made over 3 million paid deliveries. This, again, is not a science fair project. This is a real thing in production, delivering stuff to people all around the world thousands of times every day. Someone ordered something from this grocery store. The grocery store came and put it in the robot. This robot is driving autonomously. It gets human help when it has something really hard to do, but most of the time it's driving on its own. Being able to get you anything in less than 30 minutes for an extremely low price, like a couple of lev in order to deliver it, means big things for the retail world. It's scary stuff for the retail world, frankly, but it's happening and it's going to continue to happen. So here we see a change in the structure of our cities because transportation is what defines the city. It's the purpose of the city to be close and a quick journey to your friends, to your job, to everything in your life, whether you walk or drive or bicycle. And in the 19th century, the tram redefined the city from what the horse had produced. In the 20th century, the car redefined the city. And in the 21st century, these new technologies and more, like scooters and tunnels, and maybe even hyperloops, I don't know about that, but they will redefine the city as well. So mobility is the circulatory system of our lives. And as it's taken over by the computer, that will be changed as dramatically as all the other industries taken over by the computer have done. We get the opportunity to reduce our CO2 emissions by billions of tons of carbon dioxide as we move from burning gasoline into electricity. And it makes, for the people who win the game, trillions of dollars, which is certainly something that they have find appealing. And in the end, we also get to save millions of lives. And that is, in some ways, more than all of this, although oddly, I don't know why we, we we somehow put up with the millions of people who die in car accidents. I'm sure that most of you know someone or had someone close to you die or be seriously injured in a car accident. Most places people have. But we are going to change this. Um, not instantaneously. It takes work to make things safe. But people are working on this, and they are going to change the world. Thank you very much. Now, I don't like just talking to people. I like to be interactive. So I've left a couple of minutes. If someone has a question they'd like to ask about where this is going, please come forward with your question. Yes? What's the wildest thing that you've seen? The it's, the, it's this music. They, uh, even though my clock's going, they want me off the stage, I guess. Um, wildest thing. What's the wildest thing you've seen that you think will be implemented in the next three years? You mean in this particular field? Anything I'm looking for, well, that's, that's such a broad question. I mean, in, Maybe they stick to this field. Yeah, no, I mean, I think the flying vehicles are, are actually, though, now, will they, you will not see them commonly in three years uh, because there are these other problems to solve. But uh, I've been studying the fact that all of these technologies, say transportation defines where we live. There's actually five technologies that define where we live, which have all changed recently. And, of course, solar power means you can have power anywhere, right? Uh, um, Starlink from Elon Musk and other tools, satellite tools, means you can have high-speed data anywhere so you can live and work anywhere because the virus has made all the companies tolerate a lot of their people actually working from home. Um, the flying vehicles are going to let you travel anywhere, so suddenly the whole world is going to have the opportunity to live and work wherever it wants. It just needs water. Water is the one technology that is being worked on, but it still takes a little bit of work to get you water anywhere. 
But you combine all these things together, we're going to get uh, very interesting changes in, in where we live. We might live in the country, in the city. We might swap homes on the weekend. When companies only want you to work for, in the office for two or three days a month, is this happening in Bulgaria now? Because it's happening in many other places. Uh, it was not expected. It came from the virus. And uh, that's having a big change on the world. Another question? Are you all just like stupefied and... Yes, quick. What short term adaptations must be made to our infrastructure to allow for the... Yes, so he's asking how do we change our infrastructure and this is a great question because the answer is we don't. All right, not at first. The trick about software is software changes in a day and infrastructure changes in 10 years. So anything you can solve in software, you solve with software. If you try and change the roads, the cars mostly just have to drive around it because they don't need that change. There's the gong. Thank you very much for your attention.